So when we look at the stability of various nuclei, the uh, various isotopes of various elements, uh, when we look at the nucleus, it's an interesting situation. The average density of a nucleus is 2 times 10 to the 14th grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, ooh, okay, so then 1 cubic centimeter, 1 milliliter volume of a nucleus has a mass of 2 times 10 to the 14th grams. That is 2 times 10 to the 11th kilograms. Well, one kilogram is like 2.2 pounds, so this is like 8 times 10 to the 11th pounds. Well, a billion is 8 times 10 to the 9th. So then 8 times 10 to the 11th would be like a 0.4 trillion pounds. One milliliter of a nucleus would weigh about 4.4 trillion pounds, or about 100 billion pounds per centimeter cubed. Ooh. All right. Or about 9 trillion times more dense, 9 trillion times more dense than osmium, the densest element known. Those nuclei are very, very small. Those protons and neutrons are packed together really tight, but that gives us a problem. Protons repel other protons. What is holding this nucleus together? When you have such tremendous proton-proton repulsions. Now, uh, a little uh, long story short here. The answer is what's known as the strong nuclear force. However, that's a lot of repulsion. And so any nucleus that's not very stable will go through nuclear reactions to try to become more stable to try to ease some of these proton-proton repulsions. And the general rules for predicting nuclear stability. One thing to look at is what are called the magic numbers. It turns out nuclei with two protons and neutrons, eight particles in the nucleus, 20, 50, 82, 126 protons and or neutrons in the nucleus, these tend to be more stable. If they have these number of protons or neutrons in there. For example, tin has 50 protons in its nucleus. It has 10 stable isotopes. Antimony has 51 protons in the nucleus and only has two stable isotopes. A stable isotope is one that does not decay versus uh, via radioactive processes, does not give off alpha particles or beta particles or gamma particles spontaneously. So there are 10 stable isotopes of tin, only two stable isotopes of antimony. There are more isotopes of antimony, antimony, only two of them are stable because it just it's not one of those magic numbers. 50 protons, most of the isotopes of tin are stable. 51 protons, not a magic number, not as stable isotopes. Other little tricks to look for. Nuclei with an even number of protons and an even number of neutrons tend to be more stable. All right. Isotopes with atomic numbers greater than 83 are all radioactive, meaning if we look on the periodic table, uh, element 83 is bismuth, which means starting with polonium here, every one of elements that are, have atomic numbers larger than polonium means every isotope is unstable. Every isotope of polonium is radioactive. Every isotope of uranium is radioactive. Okay. So bismuth does have a, at least one stable isotope that is not radioactive. But once you get a 84, every single isotope of of all the elements above 84 are radioactive. They will decay eventually into something else through alpha or beta emission or maybe gamma. All right. All isotopes of technetium, atomic number 43, and promethium, atomic number 61, are radioactive. Technetium and promethium do not have any stable isotopes either, even though they are smaller atomic numbers than uh, 84. Okay. And when we look at all of 
our elements and look at their isotopes and their stability, we come up with this graph. And graph is a stabelt of ability or band of stability, it's sometimes called. So if we look at elements and look at the number of neutrons in the nucleus compared to the number of protons in the nucleus, in this line right here, this one going right here, represents where the number of protons equals the number of neutrons. So if you're on this line, you have 70 protons, that would be 70 neutrons. Okay. Note, all of our lighter elements, helium, the main isotope of helium has two protons and two neutrons. Carbon has six protons and six neutrons. Nitrogen has seven protons, seven neutrons. Oxygen, eight protons, eight neutrons. The main isotopes of all these guys have the same number of protons as neutrons. They're right along this line. However, as you start getting up above about 20 protons and 20 neutrons, you start curving above this line. We're starting to pack so many protons in there that are repelling each other that you need more neutrons in the way to spread out those protons just a little bit so the repulsions aren't so strong. Such that if you have atomic number 80, atomic number 80 is mercury. If you're atomic number 80, there are no isotopes, none at all, that have 80 protons and 80 neutrons. That's just too many protons too close together to be stable at all or to exist at all. So you have to put more neutrons in there, have a higher number of neutrons. If you're atomic number 80, you have to have a high, much higher number of neutrons in there in order to try to distance some of those protons from each other so that the positive-positive repulsions aren't so tremendous. All right. So, in general, if an isotope falls in this belt of stability, it will be a stable isotope and not radioactive. Most of our radioactive isotopes lie outside this belt. Note we only go up to 80 here because if we recall once we get to 84, none of them are stable. There's no stability at all once we're up at 84. But so these are elements that all have at least one or more stable isotopes that do not decay radioactively. And you'll find them in this belt of stability here. So what if you have a nucleus that's above the belt, that's higher than this shaded area here, a nucleus above here? Note, for the number of protons, if it's above this, say you're looking at an element with 40 protons, here's the band of stability here, belt of stability. If it's above that, it means it has too many neutrons to have for 40 protons. If it's above the belt, too many neutrons for the number of protons. That means it will undergo beta particle emission, because recall, beta emission changes a neutron into a proton. So if it's above the belt, that means it has too many neutrons for that number of protons. Beta emission changes a neutron into a proton. So it changes, gets rid of a neutron, which means it goes down a little bit, and gains a proton, which means it goes to the right a little bit. We get towards that band of stability. For example... The radioactive nucleus carbon-14, carbon-14, six protons, 14 protons plus neutrons. When it undergoes beta decay, it turns into a nitrogen-14. One more proton, but the same number of protons and neutrons. We started with 14 protons and neutrons, ended with 14 protons and neutrons. But we have one more proton, which means we have one less neutron. So carbon-14 decays radioactively into nitrogen-14. In doing so, it gives off a beta, a beta particle as a neutron became a proton. And nitrogen-14 is stable. Seven protons, seven neutrons. It's right here, on, right in the middle of this band of stability. Okay, what about a nucleus that's below the belt? Well, then it has too few neutrons for that number of protons. There are two ways that this can occur if it's below the belt. Two ways of doing this. One is positron emission. 
a proton will convert into a neutron and give off a positron, that antimatter particle. For example, potassium-38, when it decays radioactively, turns into an argon-38. Note, 38 plus, 30, 38 plus what equals 38? 0. 18 plus what equals 19? Well, 18 plus 1 is 19, so this is 0 plus 1. That is a positron. Yes, it's beta here. We put beta... The Greek symbol beta, because it's coming from the nucleus, but recall beta with a plus one down here is a positron. Beta with a minus one down here is a beta particle or electron. This is a positron. So, that is one way to increase the number of neutrons and decrease the number of protons. Positron with positron emission, a proton turns into a neutron. And that will happen if it's below the belt, meaning there's too few neutrons for the number of protons. Proton turns into a neutron. Another way is electron capture. If we have an electron plus a proton, a proton can capture the electron and turn into a neutron. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. So a proton can capture an electron and turn into a neutron. For example, argon-37, when it, that isotope is below the belt of stability, uh, we find that it, un it undergoes electron capture to produce chlorine-37. All right. Now, okay, how do we predict wh uh, whether something is above the belt of stability and undergoes beta emission or below the belt of stability and undergoes positron emission or electron capture. Well, the best way to do this is assume that the average atomic mass is going to be very similar to a stable isotope. The average atomic mass, let's assume it's a stable isotope. Then you compare the mass of the isotope to the average atomic mass. Okay. So, for example, let's look at here with our carbon-14. Well, the average mass of carbon is carbon-12. 12. Carbon-12 12 has a mass of average carbon is 12.01 as the atomic mass. So this carbon-14 has a larger atomic mass than carbon-12. So if this carbon-14 is radioactive, it has a larger mass than the, sta than the stable isotopes, then we expect larger mass means too many neutrons, then it's above the belt of stability and will undergo beta emission. Uh, let's look down here. We had uh, potassium-38. Well, normally potassium is 39. Well, if this is potassium-38 and normal potassium is 39, if 39 represents stable potassium, that comes from the periodic table, this is below that stability, below the stable isotopes, so we'd expect it to do positron emission or electron capture. Same thing with our argon. Our argon, the average atomic mass of argon is 39.95. Argon-37 is below the mass of argon-39, we expect this to be stable, therefore if this is unstable, we expect it to be the, below the belt of stability, which means it'll either undergo positron emission or electron capture. Truth is, your book has a pretty decent explanation, but for right now, let's just go with, we. it's really difficult to tell whether it's going to under, undergo positron emission or electron capture. I think the nuclear physicists who really study this have more of a feel for which way it's going to go because they've seen it too much. For our class, for our purposes, I will not expect you to know if it's positron emission or electron capture. All you need to know that if it's below the belt of stability, then it will either need to do positron emission or electron capture because it does not have enough neutrons for that number of protons. We need to change a proton into a neutron. All right. And also... 
one thing, if you're above 83, we know that none of the isotopes of elements that have, a, an atomic, or have an atomic number higher than 83 are stable. These tend to go via alpha emission. So if you are above atomic mass of 83, it means you have too much mass, too many protons and too many neutrons. So alpha emission gets rid of two protons and two neutrons. It doesn't always do alpha emission. Sometimes it does beta emission, but we find alpha emission tends to be more common.